Hey everyone. Welcome. We are back. We are now here at continued still at the Women in Technology Summit. And we are now sitting down with Nero Kosa. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate having us. Yes, thank you. And we will be talking about the CK12 Foundation, what you're building right now, how it's mm -hmm. impacting people. This is really exciting. And let's go ahead and start talking about it. So um, teach us about what it is, and we'll ask you some questions. So CK12 is a nonprofit foundation, and its mission is to bring access and uh, reduce cost. That's how we first started. Um, I'm happy to tell you my story a little bit to kind of build a background on this. Yes. So when I um, came to this country, I joined, um, I got a degree in molecular biology and I became a molecular biologist and I did some research on, I was doing research on um, uh, cancer genes, DNA, and its expression, and working with radioactivity and all kind of you know, exciting tools that came out in the 80s. But I became pregnant with my first child. And at that point, I gave up my um, career because it was radioactivity or pregnancy. So I decided to give that up. And I continued to have three more kids, so I have four kids. And the, first, the thing that I... Busy mom. Busy, you know. Yeah. But I also had to figure out what I was going to do for my kids. And since I had the time and the inclination, so I went out and found the best school, which is child-centric, which was about the children learning by doing. Yes. And they had no textbooks. They had, you know... The library, which was the center of the universe, and the kids went there. They picked out their own, you know, figured out their information and kind of learned like that. So as they went through, I became more fascinated, and I spent a lot of time in the classroom and soon started asking questions how kids learn and, you know, what are the uh, things that get in the way? How does a teacher teach so many kids in a classroom? So from there, when my kids finished and went on to high school, at 50 years old, I went back to school to get another degree in education to find out what the issues were. It was there that I found out cost was an issue, one size fits content in the form of a textbook, which you couldn't customize, was an issue, and not being able to teach kids with different abilities at the same time in the classroom were the kind of things that, you know, I said, okay, why can't we then do a technology solution? And so at that point, I found myself a co-founder who was a technologist, had been funded by Planner Perkins. We'd done three companies for them. And he had just finished his last one, and I kind of roped him in and said, let's do this. And I had never run a company, but it was my passion that I was so passionate about but I knew we, someone had to do this. So today, uh, after 11 years, we have a technology, we have the content that goes in the technology. Most ed tech companies are actually providing just the technology. And so for me, doing CK12 was actually, um, you know, a way to kind of give back. And what we did was give everything for free. But you can customize everything, everything standards aligned because it's foundational, it's 4K to 12, can be used all over the world. And so that's how CK12 came about. about. It's interesting hearing your story about how when you were going through molecular biology um, that the pregnancy happened and then it was almost a, first of all, I wonder if there's a way to help support women that want to pursue careers at the same time that they want to support their children. Mm -hmm. And then also, then it kind of led you to ending up being with the CK12 Foundation. Otherwise, you might have worked on cancer genes for yes. a very long time. Right. Um, so now that this opened up, it's been about 10 years, right? CK12? 11 years. 11 years. So now, so, so the, one of the things that you mentioned was you started analyzing education and seeing what are the limiting factors. Mm -hmm. for children to be fulfilled 
through all of the knowledge that they can actually get and the foundational knowledge right, specifically. Right, right. And the biggest one you said was cost. Yeah. Okay. In so the U.S. Okay. In the U.S. Okay. Um, so interesting. So then uh, now I want to know kind of what are the what are the other limiting factors in other places in the world um, and how are they different? Well, to some extent, uh, you know, government run a lot of educations in different countries and they subsidize it. And their subsidization, I mean, I went to the president of India at that time, uh, Dr. Kamal Hussain. Um, uh, I forget. Name Kamal. Um, and as I was talking to him, I said, you know, I'd like to do this project in India. That was in 1993. And he looked at me and he says, Neil, do you realize that um, it costs pennies for us to give books to the students in India? There's no way that, you know, we are paying the same kind of money you guys are because the publishers, it's a business. Right. So as a result of that, I think the cost is much higher in the European country or the Western con countries versus other, con other countries. The cost isn't that much of an issue. But I think what you get is a lot of, um, you know, you get just some text to learn from in those countries. They don't have the luxury of having access to the newer technologies that come along, like with, you know, computers, you can give a video, you can give an interactive, you can give feedback in the right time. Otherwise, these children are sitting there waiting for their exams to be given back to them, the results. And, you know, they've lost that moment where they've been agonizing over, did I do that question right? You lose that thought. So there's, you know, a lot of, so there is a cost in those countries as well not so much on the cost of the tech, uh, the content, but in terms of the cost of not learning something. Ooh. Yes. Yes. You know, not getting that feedback in time. And that's a huge cost in the USA as well as rest of the world. And that's something technology really helps with. So our system can give you feedback immediately and then also show you what you did wrong. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that and oh, say... Versus when you get the exam back. Back. And right. then you see that my mar uh, I got this question wrong. But you don't remember you the struggle. Don't remember the struggle, yes. And yes. then also then the setting up time with the teacher afterward right. to learn about it. and Yeah, versus You've getting... You've lost that continuity, you know, yeah. that, yes, that moment of aha. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what I did wrong. Because now you cannot go back to that struggle you had. Mm -hmm. Not every child, you, they've wiped it out of their memory. Human brain is like that. That is probably the coolest thing that I've learned so far. Yes. That was very interesting. So the moment of when, this is maybe a good example of how to relate this, is by when we are learning directly from a parent or directly from a boss or a coworker, a mentor, or a, mentor. Or a tutor or whoever. And when we're learning directly from, from them, them, we get a continuation yes. of the education. So when we do something like, uh, imagine if I was paraphrasing what you said, yes. but then you waited two days yes. to tell me what I, that I was That's wrong right. with how I paraphrase. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and imagine, you know, imagine learning. One thing we know about learning is that it's additive. It just doesn't happen, you know, by itself. You have to keep immersing, I mean, immersing yourself in learning, okay, one step, two step, three step, four step, you yes, know? Yes, it's additive, yeah. Yes, and then suddenly the picture becomes, at some point for different kids, the picture becomes clearer as they learn more and more and more. So imagine a young kid, a child, right, born, um, they learn to kind of lift their heads, they kind of get up and they start learning how to walk. Right? It doesn't happen overnight. It happens in, in kind of continuation. Uh, as the muscle memory kind of keeps doing something over and over again, you want to turn around, you hear sound, you hear colors. I mean, you see colors. Your baby tries to kind of, you know, and, and basically it's what the body does over time. Yeah. Similarly, the brain does the same thing. I mean, you start learning, 
you know, there are only one to nine numbers. So you start adding one to nine in units, and then suddenly you say, oh, well, if I add nine and four, that's more than nine. Now, where does that, what happens to that? So then you learn about tens, and then you learn about hundreds, then you learn about thousands, you know, and so on. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, so all these things happen. I mean, unfortunately, uh, the system has kind of come up with these 13 years of learning, K to 12, artificially because you have different kids going at different rates to learn and they, they get the aha moment faster or slower than others. And yet, you know, we kind of keep them in this. Okay, so because I can tell that we're about to get into a little bit of the personalization and the adaptive yes. technology that you've built. Yes. And I want to, we'll, we're, we're gonna get there. I wanna keep us for one more moment sure. on the additive learning and the continuum because yeah. I think that is so interesting, continuity. So with the uh, additive and the continue uh, continuity, it's as though when we, not only when we get the paper back um, that we have a grade on it, are we then, we, we, we're already breaking the continuity because we had to wait a couple of days to get the paper back, but also then is the additive learning there, as in do we take what the next moment of the educational process is and do we seize it and go and get excited about it and go and pursue it? So it depends on individual child. There's some children who will continue their hunger to do that. There are others who will be like, you know, okay, so what's the big deal, right? It depends on what kind of background they're coming from, what kind of mindset they have. And so, you know... Um, and that, that seems like a very important time to, to interject to say that the parent yes. is actually such a vital role. An adult. An, an adult, and yes. but but is for almost everybody on the planet. Most people, it's it's specifically the parent, the parent's responsibility. If you birth the child into the world, yes. it is it's for, foremost your um, responsibility and the communities together. Yes. But but yours specifically is to inspire the child with all of the different opportunity that's available for you're, them to actually. You're absolutely right. Okay, it is the parent's responsibility. But let's be honest. Okay, there are parents in this world who cannot do this for whatever reason, right? You could say they come from a, a place of not being able to help their child. They can come from, they don't know what to do with their child. They don't, you know, they did, probably didn't go through the formal uh, education system themselves. My father, for example, was the first in his generation, in his family ever, to go and do a degree in math, okay? He didn't have any role models. So how are we supposed to, now he was driven, but how is every child supposed to do that? Because probably if the parents are, you know, kind of struggling to make ends meet. So I don't want to put the blame on, on the totally. parents and not give them that kind of, you know, uh, responsibility. But let's think about this. If there is a teacher, and I've seen teacher, that's what kind of fascinated me and got me, wrote me into education. I saw the best teacher who knew every child in her classroom. Mm -hmm. But there aren't that many of them. Mm -hmm. She knew exactly, she would keep folders on each child, what they knew, what they were, uh, you know, how to excite them, how to make something happen for them. So a lot of it was project-based, a lot of it was passion-based, and give them a purpose in life, right? That's a tall thing to do for every child. Yes. And you can't put that on the parents all the time. Yes, I think if you're in a position, you owe it to every child yeah. to do that, if you're going to bring a child in. But at some point, if a parent can't do it, society needs to step in. We, because we're in all this together. Yeah. So if you're going to have a school system, we need to find the best way to make sure a child can learn. And you know what? We keep saying change their mindset. Changing mindset is the hardest thing to do. Yes. It's so hard. So difficult to do right? that. Yeah. There are, you know, there's a whole push, you know, there's a whole movement about mindset. I'm a big believer of mindset, but yes. 
to change people from where they are to where you want them to be, it's very difficult. So um, let's 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 work our way in um, into into the, the adaptive learning by saying this. So we have um, both the the parent takes lots of responsibility for the child. So does the community, the teachers around the child, um, to provide lots of opportunity for the child to actualize into um, the what you what you've built um, enables more continuity. Yes. So that the child, when they're when they are using um, your platform, are able to get instant feedback right. about what they what they're learning and how they're learning it. Mm -hmm. And you you've created. Uh, I, I would love to learn more about the algorithms that provide the adaptive um, side of the learning process. So the continuity is there now. How is it um, adaptive? Because we have friends that are working on um, uh, with like Adam Gazelli and the and Neuroscape the, um, and Achille Interactive, these, these different labs that are working on um, video games that can do things like help kids with ADHD, help right. them focus, help you with higher working memory, these types of things. So we're interested in what the um, adaptive tech is, how it... Yeah, so it, it's, it's a, not a simple system, okay? It's, it has a lot of in information being put into it. So there are two things. There's the content itself, and there's the technology itself. So as far as the t content goes, we've created a, a continuum of the content in math and science. We've actually also now interrelated the math and science so that we have connections how, you know, you know, they might connect. And I'll speak to that a little bit later. But we have the content that's passed into concepts, it's passed into what are the skills and, you know, how it's how much time they spent, did they read, did they, how much time they took to do the, you know, the actual, uh, the, each content has um, practice attached to it that we can tell how much uh, they know. So it's an adaptive practice. So if it's too hard for you, it'll go easy. If yep. it's hard, if it's too easy, easy it'll go hard yep. for you. The ability to create content in a continuum way, knowing the knowledge pathways, and like I was telling you about units and tens and hundreds and thousands, you know, the ability to be able to create those connections. Mm -hmm. And these connections are very complex. They're not yes, easy, yes, yes. right? Because they could be coming from any which way. Yes. And so, um, we have taken time to create those and we are constantly improving those algorithms that, you know, that goes into the, into a black box, as you might say, of algorithms. And, uh, so that content and the technology that we built along with it, um, starts putting out, uh, you know, what the student knows, what the student doesn't know, what the teacher needs to know to help the student. So we've kind of put created this whole system around uh, this learning. And if you use it continuously from, you know, day one to next to next to next, year after year, I, I think it's a teacher helper or a parent helper, Yeah. right? So it's taking away, it's taking away the wait time for the students so they don't have forget about what they learned or what they didn't do right. In the moment we can tell them, yeah. And we can say, we can recommend to them way, you know, what they might want to refresh that they might have missed. So you could have been, you know, in sec two years back, you could have missed something and you don't remember it. We can say, hey, can you go back and re review that? And come back, and you can. So we don't never want to discourage kids and say, mm -hmm. "No, you're you're you did you're failing or you're whatever." We want to be very supportive for the students to want to learn. And so, if you're a shy kid or you're behind, you shouldn't have a, a you know feel bad about yourself. And we want to be able to get you where you need to be. Does that help? Yes. I liked how you described the complexity of the content and then it is very complex. And then also how it can be 
taught in more novel and easy to understand ways and continuous ways yes. in adaptive ways too easy we go harder too hard we go easier until you gain a momentum yes. and you pick things up and these different strategies that you're implementing they've been they kind of been lost because we've went from um in many cases, we've went from a single teacher to right. a couple dozen students, yes. and like you said, each student is different. Yes, um, each student, and this is this is partly with um, the advent of um, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics into our world that it becomes a, a personal learning agent that helps the student. Um, yeah, tailored and customized to them, to their learning abilities and styles. Um, but there is this sort of foundational um, knowledge that needs to be learned. And then the, some, such, such as language, very important to be able yep. to communicate, mm -hmm. um, uh, science, math, um, history. Um, uh, and then, and then f f from there, uh, art and music kind of continue humanity built, humanity's building up and, um, and then having, so then, so then when does the child like about, this is, this is interesting to ask. At about what time, uh, at age 12, or where does the child start to be able to personalize what they're learning a little bit more towards their interests? See, that's an excellent question. Excellent. So the, when, when, we in, when I envisioned this system, we were thinking about everyone being able to customize their own, right? A teacher customizing, a parent customizing, or even a child customizing. When you think about learning at this level, this foundational learning, it's hard for a child to know what I have to learn next, right? They don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't know that there are tens and there are hundreds and there are thousands and there are millions, right? They don't know that. They don't know in, in science, they don't know the complexity. You know, when you're teaching these kids, Physics and chemistry and all are taught in a very abstract fashion. An abstraction for a child is, is very hard to get to. They start out very concrete. Yeah. So if they start out con concrete, um, they're not going to be able to say how, you know, there's a critical thinking, creative thinking, there's, you know, the, those levels are higher level thinking. So similarly, what we have to do with them um, is kind of hold their hand till one day they say, oh, wait a second, this is what's missing from them. But that stage is very different for each child. Some people, some children don't even get there even in college. So I don't know how the brain works yeah. enough. I don't think we all know how the brain works enough. I mean, I keep looking for these things. I would do a lot of literature search mm -hmm. on this stuff. But there isn't anything that says, you know, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to know that the child is there to move on to deciding themselves? In general, when you get to college, you're supposed to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure everyone gets there. <sighs> I, I wonder if there's a, if there's something about the maybe speed at which can be calculated of the student's progress in a specific subject that can indicate their understanding and their interest past just making the content harder for them, yeah. but also being like, hey, there's these three branches of math now that yeah. we'll just offer to you. Yeah. And then, you know, are, do any of these sound interesting? A little one, two sentence summary of each one of them and how they're applicable, let's right. say, in the right. real world. And then they can, maybe that maybe that's happening at the age of 12. Um, maybe it's happening earlier as well when uh, maybe they go down a rabbit hole in, in, the, in the mathematics and the certain aspect of it right. that, that gets them to really uh, go, get very excited about logic and something yeah. like that. Yeah. So I think unless you teach students, hold their hands and take them that path, which is not what's done in, in the school, the public school system doesn't do that. So they have very standards, they have an exams to pass. So most of the teachers are actually teaching them based on those exams because 
they're, uh, you know, kind of, um, they themselves are uh, uh, judged by how their students do on the standardized exam. And so as a result, the real learning is lost. So with CK12, from very early on, we have this theory that we are going to teach you from, so if you look at what we call simulations, um, we kind of take the stand that we are going to talk about, say, how does a plane stay af afloat, right? Mm -hmm. And so and relatable we, examples, yeah. Real world yeah. applications yeah. of that. And so if you start talking to them about trust, thrust, and you talk about free diagram, free you know, energy diagram, they're lost. But what if you were to able, be able to relate this, this question and to think about what are the subcomponents of this question and then be able to show them and let them play with it? Mm -hmm. Very often these are taught as tweak the variables yes. as well themselves. That's right. Mm. So we do that mm. with chemistry, we do that with physics right mm. now. I'd love to create, uh, you know, I'd love to create some partnership to do that with biology and finish all these and kind of... We might them. have some ideas for you. Yeah, yeah, so I'd love to do that because, you know, we can only go at the... We're only 30 people in Palo Alto and then another, you know, 15, 20 people in India. Yet we're doing all this ourselves and so Whoa. Um, and teachers are submitting content uh, as a contractor to you and then you but those are it. those are mostly written things this other stuff mm. we do ourselves the video the the simulations and the ability to interact Oof. with the stuff the adaptive system the intelligent system oh, with the so AIs yes all that we are doing in house by ourselves and the teachers are submitting text learning yes they're doing the actual content oh. on on you know the like the flex book which is a customizable textbook uh huh flex and book. yes yeah, yeah. so they are doing that part of it and uh, so we created about two hundred. 50 flexbooks for all K-12. Okay. Today we have over 200,000 flexbooks customized by teachers in schools and districts. Wow. And they're all free. They're, so the, another good thing about all this, you know, customization is not just personalization, but the ability to hold institutional memory yeah. in one place. Yeah. Like the teacher I was talking about the earlier. The Long Na Foundation kind of does some of that yeah. work as well. Yeah. Right. So she passed away. But all the memory she had about stuff went with her. Right. So if institutions every year can figure out what worked today, this year, and you iterate on it next year, that you're constantly improving by learning, learn by doing. Yeah. Right. So that's the, that's the power of the system. That's the power of technology. Technology by itself is just just a tool. It's like a hammer. I mean, a hammer and a nail and so, and, and until there's a human being doing something with it, it's of no value. So one thing that we did from the beginning was not only just create the technology, we actually create the payload to go with it. And so that, you know, is what's not what most ed tech companies are doing. They, they are looking for content because they didn't build it. And so, you know, we are where we are. It's so inspirational hearing about the work that 45 people are doing to both uh, make all these flex books as well as all the teachers that are helping make the flex books and this huge memory bank now yes. of, of content that is now able to be accessed from around the world for free. Yes. Huge. And then, then on top of that, also making the simulations that then students can go and experientially tweak variables yes. and be able to see how things change. I very vividly remember in middle school playing with a bridge simulator. Mm. And that was so fun for me because yes. I remember messing with, you know, the math, the physics, the architecture mm -hmm. and actually yes. seeing how stress testing when a lighter car or exactly. a heavier car. Yes. Yes. And so that and you know and it was green and then when it went yellow and red then it you would break and and so these types of and with planes Exactly. This is how we better understand our world. It was just like a bobsled. How does the bobsled keep on its track? You know, 
I, I tried to convince my uh, developers to let it crash, but they were upset. They said, we can't let it crash. What if some student, you know, parent gets upset? I said, but anyways, next, next level, next version of that will be a crash. But, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you're right. I mean, there's so many things that we do, a bow and arrow or, mm. you know, uh, sound or, yeah. If you think about, you know, how does snow melt? Yeah. So for chemistry, we actually go into the, the atomic structure of snow. Mm -hmm. We zoom into it so they can mm -hmm. understand how salt, when you sprinkle salt on snow in, in the mountains mm -hmm. or on the streets, yeah. how that in, uh, interacts with the water structure, mm -hmm. frozen structure, to release the energy or, you know, just those kind of... We've got finished the physics simulations, but we have to do the chemistry. We've done half the chemistry. We have to do um, the other half by the by the end of hopefully by the end of this years we'll be able to finish those. It takes time to really envision those and create them. Um, but uh, and twenty million people from around the world last year yes. used yes. CK twelve. Yes, and then how many of them were active monthly? Um, you know, I don't remember that number, but it's not as great as that because most people just want to download. They don't really understand that we have all that. Mm. So we haven't done a good job. We don't advertise too much because we're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And this stigma of nonprofit and free means that it can't be quality. It can't be, you know, this great stuff. But, uh, you know, I think yeah. we have... Uh, above average, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the numbers. No worries. Yeah. The, there's, out of the 20 million people that are using this, is there a good percentage of them in the United States versus... Yeah, most of them are from the United States. Over 80%, half. Over 80%, 75% to 80%. 85% in the U.S. Because they have access. Wow. That's still like over 5 million-ish people are in, from other places yeah. around the world. That is really so interesting. We'll see when these simulations get translated into Portuguese, into yes. Korean, into Chinese, into Hindi, into German. That's what's happening that, you know, we'll get more and more. So but you have a plane simulation? Which other uh, kind of related We've got ones? like 100 and something simulations that are... Uh, on site, you should go take a look, ck12.org. ck12.org, yes. yes. And then um, I'm so excited to go and play around with the simulations and also send them around. And link will be in the bio, of course, for everybody to check out. Um, oh my gosh, we could just chat for so long about education and the, and the importance of these fundamental um, pieces of knowledge for parents to help inspire for CK12, to help inspire community, to help inspire and the importance of that. You know, we're at Witty right now, Women in Tech International at the summit. Um, what can we do specifically to maximize the potential of young women into our world? Um, I, I think what I believe, first of all, I don't differentiate between women, girls, and boys. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a really... Human. Yes. Yes. I think it's a really important message to give all children. This is not about your gender. This is not about color. This is not about anything other than you as a human being. You can learn anything you want. So I would encourage, hey, stop being, I'm a girl or I can, you know, don't be afraid. Just go do it. Mm -hmm. And we should support them as much as we can, which means we should support them in the real world, not separate them from boys and separate them for some, you know, I, I don't believe in that separation. I think, you know, um, early on when we were raising our kids, we put computers on the floor even when they were born. And then when they started crawling, they would go and, you know, kind of play around with them. It didn't matter. So we, you know, we've, for, fortunately for us, you know, we are in a, we were in a different position. But I think all of us can take those kind of uh, steps where we don't differentiate that you're a girl or a boy. It takes time to get that into their head. I mean, the generation that's kind of frozen right now 
it's harder to change their mindset versus the next generation that's coming up. So I highly recommend that all adults, all women, go and mentor in the class, in their local classrooms. Go and say, look, I am a scientist. Look, I am whatever I am. You know, you can do it too. So this is going to take a little bit of time, but I think we should be able to mentor. Everyone needs mentoring. That's what we heard at Midwitty. That's how most women are going. We need mentorship. Yes. And so do children. I like your firm, how firm you are about human and the importance of that. Once we start differentiating, breaking people up, let's just call it all human and let's yes. call it equal opportunity to access all these different yes. technologies for education and for inspiration and for actualization for each human, for each child. Um, when they're born into the world, completely align with that, yeah. I, I actually, can I say something about that? Yes. I worry about, you know, this, uh, the generations of, say, uh, excuse me, but I don't know how to say it, so I'm going to say it, the white boy syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. We are, 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 we are creating an un, unintended consequence of, say, raising others by pulling someone down, mm. right? This is what the previous generations did. They, you know, pushed the uh, minorities to stay ahead. Mm. Now we want to push those, pull them down and bring up this. I think there's got to be some other way to kind of keep all people mm -hmm. kind of moving ahead and not putting, pulling someone down so the others can rise. Mm -hmm. right? That's what we have to find that equilibrium so that we can actually not do unintended consequences. Um, yeah. I just I just saw a a post that was about like why can't women hate men? And I was like, wait a second. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. Like can we just figure out how to all be as yes. humans together? Yes. Because you just made it very clear like there was definitely pushing people down to go up, but now by pushing these, these down guys. to go up, we're not any better. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We're yeah. not any better. So, you know, for me, I think it would be great if, you know, we kind of say, okay, full headed, how do we all make forward movement? Yes. Right. And, you know, there's so much stuff to be done. Even these systems we're talking about, they're not perfect. We just started out on them. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Right? The, the internet just started. To, like, yes. Yeah. In terms of the length of evolution. And, exactly. And here we are pressing our fingers onto computers. That's and right. Without any uh, real hard looks at how it's affecting our psychology, our human yes. interaction. Yes. Um, without any hard looks at structure for advertising and the way that companies make revenue. Um, but you took a very hard look at education. Now I want to just quickly make sure that you address this because the general data privacy rights things could be coming a, a bigger deal now. Um, so students that are under the age of 13 need a parental consent to yes. use the platform. Right. Um, um, but besides... Although previously, as a nonprofit, we didn't have to worry about that. Mm. And when, it, when you think about this, right, a child under 13 comes to CK12, and I'm going to say to that child, I'm sorry, you can't learn anything until your parent gives you permission. Yeah, I know. Right? I mean, the irony of that, it kills me. Yeah. Especially if the parent has some, there's some sort of a struggle in the relationship between the kid and the parent. They pay, the kid almost can't act as a sovereign individual uh, before the age of 13. I want to know how a plane flies. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If, no, and I'm you're, sorry. You're, th no, you're under you're 13, 13. You can't do that. Yeah. And they need to sign off. Yes. And then what if the parent says that I don't want you to learn how the, a the plane uh, flies? Yeah. Which parent wouldn't want to do, do that? Do that. Yeah. That, that, gosh, it almost adds a layer of complexity. Yes. But it also it adds a layer of security at the same time. So it's kind of hard to... Well, you know, I think what's, what's, I, I always ask when, okay, Google and Facebook, I completely understand that, that you don't want your kids to be on it all the time and 
whatever, and who are they being exposed to? But it's a place like CK12, yeah, yeah. Right? where you're going to practice. No, yeah. you can't practice. Oh, so it's almost like general data privacy rights should be a, a little bit more tailored to individual sites. Yes. Because on Facebook, it totally makes sense. Exactly. Versus on CK12. This is so like the, ridiculous. That's a good point, yeah. Right? Yeah. This is so ridiculous that you want a child who, in the moment, has this curiosity and wants to learn something, goes on a site under 13, and there's a, no, you can't enter. Yeah, yeah. You can't satisfy your curiosity. Oh my gosh, Nuru. Oh, wow. This is so fascinating. We could talk for so long about this. Do, I want to ask you a, a couple quick rapid fire questions on the way out. Um, how about we ask about um, how do we kind of balance the we are one mentality with the importance of geopolitical leadership? That's, that's the problem. Right. I mean, when you think about even in the U.S. today, uh, you know, I don't really want to get into the political realm because it's so hard to solve that. Mm -hmm. I think we, we, we ourselves are, uh, I think education should be separated from political. I think it's a shame that kids don't have access. And because of political reasons, I mean, you get funding and then you get funding cut back and we, you know, whatever. And, you know, if you think about divorce and she's funding um, charter schools that are religious or, you know, all these complexity, I want to stay focused and pure. So this is why we are a nonprofit. We don't care about all that. We are going to give you foundational information and learning uh, um, tools that will help you learn. I don't want to get caught up in any of that political stuff. Oh, man, it's such a difficult question to yes, answer. I, it is. I, 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 I'm really pressed to ask leaders around the world this question. Okay, how about, um, are, now what do you think about the, um, although everybody in terms of socioeconomic status is slowly coming up, mm -hmm. everyone's slowly coming up, exponential technology is causing a very, very exactly. sh sharp increase yes. for the very wealthy right now. Yes. What do we do about the low and middle class? You know, it, that's, that's a really tough situation because if you think about it, uh, human beings... Power is num something that, you know, as long as the markets are free and as long as you're free to do whatever, whoever has the dominant position, whether it's cu currency or whether it's technology or whether it's brains to create stuff, there's always going to be these, you know, uh, people who um, have an advantage because they know how to game the system. You know, think about what's happening, what happened in the financial situation. Uh, burning made off and all those scams. I actually have no idea how we're going to solve those. Because as long as human beings um, have differences, there are going to be differences. I, I, you know, I, I don't know how to take care of that. It's going to be a really different. People will tell you they know the answers, but I think they don't know the. Nobody can know this answer. This is why we ask it because people give very interesting solutions to the problem that are part of the full solution, and then maybe we can glue together some of the pieces for a pretty good one. But you said as long as there is. The, um, the differences, it's very difficult to find something. Um, maybe if the overall uh, basic needs of the hierarchy were fulfilled to a point where we were all just then able to focus on purpose or focus on meaning, then, then at that point, uh, at least, because then there still needs to be some room for innovation and creativity for people to have an incentive for it. So this is this complication. Then there's the globalization complication to the wealth inequality conversation. 
And now we're talking about what's like the most, now you throw in artificial general intelligence and then Well, when you think about this, okay, when the internet came along, the idea was to uh, give access to everyone, equal access. That's why it was free, mm -hmm. right? When you think about it like that, um, people started, you know, you got a lot of you just user generated content. I can't even remember the last number of uh, websites created by people. I think it was in the billions or something. I might be completely wrong. I don't remember. I think it is very high. Like very, very high, high yeah. like that, right? Yeah. But how many of those actually get any people, Attention. right? So when you think about it, which sites? I mean, when you think about Google, Google and Amazon Facebook. and Apple and Facebook. And so again, the people that kind of have the knowledge, the wherewithal and the ability to game that system in whatever way, behavioral ec economics yes. and, you know, all that. So the ones that kind of are the first movers in that tend to get the uptake. And so again, when we try to kind of democratize, democratize something, it doesn't work because it can't be that everyone has equal. Equality. Yeah. yeah, equality of outcome. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, uh, so then it is uh, like the it's like the global conversation around the people that have the most power um, is needs to happen, and we need to figure out how to have that conversation. Okay. So, if you come across yes. this solution. Remember to send it to me. It, uh, I, I will spend uh, a whole lifetime uh, trying to inspire people to have the conversation and we probably will come close to figuring out a part of the solution. Only This a part. is why one of the good things about companies is that they usually only have 10 years lifespan or something like that. So there's a limited lifespan. So new generations can keep coming up. Similarly, it's, it's about renewal all the time. So other people can get a chance, at least from, you know, uh, from royalty, you know, from the prince and the kings and all that. It's changed, which were for generations, which we're still say, seeing with, you know, the Queen of uh, England, Queen Elizabeth and her family. That model is slowly disappearing, you know. Mm -hmm. So now a common person can actually rise up. So things are changing. It's just that it's a constant flux. And so new ideas will keep coming up. Yeah. That's the only change that will actually, in the end, give everyone a chance. Yeah. And that's, I love the millennial generation, the yeah. Gen Z generation, because they're just so, they're thinking in such different ways and they yes. have access to technology in such different ways. Um, okay, a couple last thoughts is um, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh my God, my children, my dogs, my husband, um, my home, and nature. Yeah. And that, you know, I jumped out of a plane one time, and when I jumped Good. out... I did too. It's right? the most amazing, one of the most amazing. Things. Oh my God, when, you, when the chute opened, then it was unbelievable. Evil, just completing Yes. The Yes, and, and, and you realize what a beautiful thing we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you're parachuting. Yeah. Skydiving. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, go skydiving and at white least water once. rafting. I've done this, you know. I'm getting yep. old. Yes, so um, actually immersing ourselves in the experiences that awaken us to the beauty of the Absolutely. earth. Okay, um, how about, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? I hope not. Yeah. It'll be more interesting to yeah. have other people there. Yeah, yeah. You know, Deborah Fisher and all have been looking at, you know, this whole thing, and they, they're finding stuff. She's a astrophysicist, um, and they're finding, you know, they're finding stuff. So I hope you find yeah. other, it'll be interesting. And I hope they're friendly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. I want to be wiped out. Have you seen Marvel, Agents of Marvel? Uh, not yet. Okay, well, you've got to see that. I'm a big Marvel, you know, comic Enthusiast, fans uh -huh. and, you know, DC fans. Yes, I yes. love all those things. Yes. Um, 
And do you think we're in a simulation? Uh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I'll let you know once I go to the other side. Side of it? <laughs> yes. Check it out. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Nira, wow, what a pleasure. Thank you. Exceptional conversation. Thank you for joining Thank you. us Thank you. on the show. This has been so fun. Thank We've you. learned so much from you. Um, really, really so cool about the continuity of the experience of education um, rather than getting the test back two days later. But you're right there to get an immediate feedback, adaptive feedback, um, and then have simulations where you can test the different yes. variables yourself as a child across the world, translated to different languages. Maybe we can make some connections for you in the biology space. That would be awesome. We would love to do that. So I will do that right when we finish the conversation. Um, Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. If you guys had a good time, make sure to subscribe, comment below with your thoughts. We'd love to um, make sure go create with this. So if you enjoyed the content, go talk to other people about it, make a video about it yourself, go write about it yourself. Uh, maybe start something in the field, submit some content to CK12 yourself. Um, also, join us. We need to continue going around to beautiful organizations like Women in Tech Summit. So we need your help on Patreon to help us scale and help us continue going and interviewing very smart people and communicating their content to you throughout the world. Um, so join us there. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you soon. Thank you.